Hello everyone, this is week six of our Kendo Talks and we have a returning speaker. This is Jackie, I'm sure you remember her from two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yondan trained in many different places, started off in Hong Kong and now is in Glasgow. She previously was talking about um Kiai. That's the one. I was like, spirit, <laughs> no, uh breathing, wait, what's the combination of them? <laughs> yeah, Kiai. And now she's coming to talk about more forms of training, the best forms of training which everyone in Kendo loves. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Izzy. Um, thank you very much for joining. And again, just like the last time, I hope everybody's well and safe. Um, so today I want to talk about Uchikome and Kagari Geiko, and um, they are very different and they teach us different things, um, and they're very um, important aspects of kendo training. Um, I'd like to discuss um, the role of the motodachi um, in both of them and why the role of the motodachi is so important. I feel in this part of the world, at times, Kakaya Keiko looks too much like Uchikome. Um, and I would like to just explain the difference between them. So basically, what do they mean? So Kakari Geiko basically means continuous non-stop cuts with high spirit and continuous and loud ki, whereas Uchikome means one cut a, at a time. So that should give you a guess of what it should look like. So why do Kakari Keiko? So Kakari Keiko builds things like stamina, strength, character, and also core training because um, when you're doing this, you have to have a really high ki, and you can't do that if you're holding, like in my last talk, I see you can't hold all your ki up here. It's got to come from your dantian or your, or your abdomen. So you cannot do this kind of exercise or, or yeah, exercise with, with breathing just up here. You've got to come from your core, so it builds on core muscles as well. Um, it also helps us assimilate all aspects of clean upon at speed. If done correctly, it's very difficult to do it much more than about 30 seconds to one minute if you are doing it properly. So um, Izzy very kindly is helping me with this. So what I want to do is I want to show you a very quick video clip of what Kagari Keiko should look like. <laughs> right, so this is Kagaya Geiko, so from kind of twenty eight seconds in. It doesn't like sharing the screen and also because it's zoomed in on this particular look tab instead. So let me just have a small. There we go. So now. There we go. This is the Kendo Eik Karigeko. Thank you. If you fast forward to like 28 seconds in and then... I can't see it, can you? Yeah, sorry.
Okay. Right. I wasn't able to see that. Did, did everybody else see it? Yeah. Yep, yeah. everyone else can see okay. it. Okay. Right. So as you can see from the video, each Kendoka attacks without stopping. So they don't go through. It's just attack, 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 attack. And um, the hits are sharp. They're small but fast, but still with correct ki, fumikomi, and a hundred percent of their body. This all builds stamina because, as you can see, it's very, very fast, very, very furious, um, and it's not easy. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, we used to do four or five sets of these, just straight after, you know, one after the other. And then the last set we had to do with um, our sensei. And if we stopped for a breath, even just for a couple of seconds, he would shout at us and say, stop resting. So um, the last ippon should be done and you should go straight through after um, your, your last hit and proper zanshin. Um, the hits also, I don't know if you noticed, come from a short mai, so it's called Isokoito Mai. So this is the reason you do this is because you're you're not having you're not expected to move um a step in first. You should just be from this distance and it's short, sharp attacks, attacks, attacks. Um so you need to be able to perform it. You need to be able to perform the next ippon without needing to take more steps forward, if that makes sense. So that's Kakari Keiko. I'll talk a wee bit more about it later on, but I just want to introduce Uchikomi, which is very different. As I said before, it means one cut at a time. And unlike Kakari Keiko, they are performed one at a time from Tomai. So Tomai means from a distance. So what you need to do is from Tomai, the correct Tomai is that if you take one step before attacking, you're in a Tomai and then you hit so it's very important to get the proper Mai. Um, the strike should always be done relaxed. Big movements with proper footwork, Kiai, Zanshin. The reason that we practice Uchikome is so that the karate is able to make immediate attacks when the um, Motodachi opens for them. So let's have a quick look at that video. Just, in, just until... Um, It's just until 2 minutes 48. Is it 2 minutes 48? Yeah, something like that, yeah. That's it, you can stop, that's it. So as you can see, hopefully you can see the difference between the two exercises. So I have found quite often um, in this part of the world that when people say, okay, we're going to do Kakari Keiko, which is the fast, quick um, practice, it looks too much like the Uchikome where people are stopping in between hits. You shouldn't be stopping. It should just be continuous. So... What's the roles of the motodachi during these two exercises? So this is very, very important. So up to a point in kendo, we can practice on our own. We can practice at home doing suburi and things like that. But so much of our learning and practice requires us to have an opponent or partner. And that's why so much emphasis is on re and respect in kendo, because we're acknowledging and thanking these partners um, or other kendoka because without them, we cannot practice and learn properly. So this is why the role of the motodachi is so important all the time, but especially during these two exercises. If the motodachi does not perform the way he or, she, he or she should, then the karate cannot do what they need to do properly. Um, so we can't learn the correct way if the motodachi is not doing it properly. So... 
What's the role of the motodachi during the during Kakari Keiko? So the role of the motodachi is just to keep Chudan Kamai in a relaxed way so that the karate is forced to make their own openings themselves. Um, they're only should, they only should be allowing effective strikes to come through. Um, sometimes senior motodachi will do this in that they will um, push the shinai out of the way if they feel not that hit wasn't good, not that hit wasn't good either, or sometimes they will attack with their own ippon. Um, my sensei in Hong Kong used to do this quite a lot, and you were made to feel that you weren't doing anything right, but this was him, his way of trying to teach you even if you're doing attack after attack after attack, you're doing it 100% properly. Um, the motodachi must be moving so that they are always in front of the kakarate so that they can launch another attack immediately. So many times I've seen motodachi just kind of standing there and then they turn and then they turn. They can't do that. During kakari keiko, they must engage there's not much point in just standing there silently while someone's expecting to do this exercise, which is high-spirited, full of energy. So quite often the motodachi will do their ki as well, which means you're then engaging with each other. Um, it's a learning experience for both. So the kakarite is learning to continuously and properly attack. Even when they're tired, they've still got to practice everything properly. The motodachi learns where to stand so they get the correct mai. So if they're with a beginner, quite often they won't understand to turn round or how they should move when they're coming forward again. So the motodachi has to always be right there so that when the kakarite turns for the next attack, they don't have to move. They can just attack straight, straight away. This cannot be done unless the motodachi is um, aware and not focused. So it's a very important job. So with that in mind, all that information in mind, let's see the video again of the Kakari Keiko. Now, while you're watching it, try and watch both sides this time. Try and watch what the motodachi is doing as well as the Kakari T. And then when you see the roles reversed. <laughs> Sorry, is Okay, so I'm not sure if after that, if you see the difference or if you see something different. Izzy and I were talking just before we came on about watching videos and seeing things. You know, if you watch the same video again after learning something or reading about something, you see something different. Um, so hopefully that will make you understand a bit more about the motodachi and why it's so important during Kakari Keiko that they need to be involved and not just like a puppet turning back and forward. They're not just standing there to be hit. They're 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 learning themselves. They're they're teaching the Kakari Te, no, you need to come closer, come come to me, hit me now. You know, you learn through Keiko. Um so Uchikome, the role of the Motodachi is just as important. Um Motodachi is pivotal to Karate's learning. Um Uchikome is performed from Tomai, so the distance in Uchikome is very, very important because the purpose of Uchikome is so that the karate learns to take one step and hits, goes through, turns round and performs Zanshin. So the whole thing about making an Ippon, and that's the whole process that they're trying to learn. 
Again, I've seen people um, practicing Uchikomi with each other and the motodachi after the karate has hit, the motodachi just stays where they are and then turns so that the karate is miles away and they have to take about four or five steps to then come back to Tomai. That shouldn't happen. So again, the motodachi needs to follow the kakarate, um, and usually the motodachi is the person that makes sure that they find the mai. Now, if you are not very um, senior and you are asked to be motodachi in this instance, finding the correct tomai can be difficult because you don't know when are they going to turn round. If they turn round, am I going to be too close to them? Do I need to step back? Do I need to step forward? So motodachi, that's your learning during Uchikomi. Um, again, the motodachi must move with the kakarate so that they can work out, OK, so they first hit, so they took three steps. So if I take three steps and stand here, when they turn around, we'll be in Tomai. OK, the other thing about Uchikomi and um, the motodachi is especially when you're fighting or doing this exercise with juniors, the motodachi has to open and let allow them to hit specific targets, whether it's men, kote, doll. Um, but so many times, again, I've seen the motodachi just come up from Songkyo and then opening immediately and the kakarate is hitting, 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 hitting. That's not the way it should be. From Songkyo, the motodachi should stand up wait for a couple of seconds to make sure that the kakarate is ready and then open, but open in a very obvious way. Again, for junior members being a motodachi doing this, this can be difficult sometimes because they're not sure how to open, when to open. So again, it's a learning experience for both. And this is very important for motodachi to understand that they're not, again, they're not just puppets standing there turning around every time the person moves past them. They're learning. Um, it's usually the motodachi's decision as to what is to be opened, whether it's men, kote, door, they can decide. And they also decide on how many hits you have to do. Um, what else? Um, so yes, if practicing with a junior, it's very important um, that you, you open obviously for them. Um, so, again, with this in mind, with thinking about the my, um, the distance, how to open, we'll watch the Uchikomi video again and see if you see anything, if you see what I'm talking about. Okay, so I think this this video demonstrates very nicely, you know, this you know the the kind of harmony between the kakarate and the motodachi, even when they when they change. I think these guys are quite senior people, um, maybe third, fourth dans, um, because they have that symmetry together. But even somebody who's junior can be a really good motodachi. And to be a good motodachi, you have to really engage and be as one with your kakarate. You also have to adjust with the level that you're practicing with. You cannot do the same as you do with a third dan that you do with, say, somebody who's second cue or who is a beginner. So as a good motodachi is able to distinguish very quickly, OK, I can't do this here. I need to be able to do that with this person. Um, so, Motodachi, you're always learning. Um, 
and um, always focused, engaging with, with the cacarity at all times and trying your best. I think that's about it. <laughs> so. So oh, thank you very much for that presentation and now we're going to open up for questions remembering there is a small delay because lag. Yeah. so I if I can start off with a small question what's your favorite variant of Chikomi Geiko and Fred Geiko so like we've been talking about the basic ones and like how you really should treat all of them but there are really fun no well I find them fun but other people think they're hell <laughs> what's your favorite kind of variant of it so what do you what do you mean by variant? So uh, basically adding on another element to Chikomi Geiko or Kere Geiko. So uh, one example is Chikomi Geiko, but every time you make a cut, you have to tra do Suryashi for the entire length of the hall. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I really, I love Kakari Keiko. Um, <laughs> I just love it. Um, I think it's such a, a fantastic exercise to really um, practice your continuous hitting. Um, I really enjoy Kakari Keiko with um, Tai Tai um, because you're not having to go through, you're having to go back, but then you also have to think about your footwork for when you're going back, then you have to go forward, but you have to do it very, very quickly. Um, if, the, if we're doing uh, Tai Tari, the Motodachi is the one at the end who decides, okay, this is this is this practice finished, because they will then open the main and you hit main and go through. Uh, but that's that's my favourite one. <laughs> that one is fun. Like, especially when it's just like, that's the last set of Kikarigeko you're doing, mm -hmm. and your Motodachi is just like, yeah, I'm going to make this hell, and you're going to yeah. love it. <laughs> I mean, the other, I mean, the other thing about Kikari Keiko is if I'm doing Kikari Keiko with um, a junior, I have to be very careful because mm. they are maybe not, if I'm the Kikari T and they are the Motodachi, sometimes I have, yeah, sometimes I have to teach them during it how to be Motodachi. And this is sometimes what we have to do. And when you are a Motodachi, um, it's not your practice it's their practice so kind of showing off an ego has to get taken out of it and you really have to help the person in front of you with what they're doing and if i'm doing kakari keiko with somebody who is the same level as me and who's really high spirited you get so much out of it so much more out of it um you're able to engage with that person, whether you're Motodachi or Kakarati, and the high spirit and the high energy just comes naturally and that's what you're trying to do, that's what you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So, no more questions have rolled in, so I'm going to ask another one. What's it like okay. to do Kikari Geiko with an eighth dan? <laughs> <laughs> that's a valid question, because like, that is an experience that not many people okay. are going to actually get. Hail. <laughs> my sensei used to he had a very I mean he he's a wonderful teacher and he teaches through Keiko um, and our basic practice was warm up um, Suburi and then Uchikomi, Gagari Keiko and then Keiko after that but you, if you did not come to sensei for Kakari Keiko he would ask you why you were being lazy. He wanted to kakari keiko with everybody that, and he would, what he what he was able to do was take you to the point during kakari keiko that you thought, my legs are not going to move anymore, my arms are not going to move anymore, I cannot breathe, my my lungs are burning, I feel awful, and he would shout one more, one more, one more, and he was always able to get two or three extra more out of you. Um, if he thought you were not giving your 100%, he would tie tie you so hard that there was times I would fall on my backside. Oh. But it was but it was great. It really it really taught you stuff. It taught you never to give up. It taught you stamina. 
um, spirit, you know, and, and he was with you 100%. You know, you would turn around and he was right there, you know, um, waiting for you. So, yeah, it's really hard, but really, really good. <laughs> for people who are watching this, uh, you couldn't see my face, but I was, like, laughing and smiling because I'm just like, oh, my God, yes, I know that kind of kikarikeko. That's my favourite kind as well. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, you yeah. feel like you're going to drop. And yes. the motorachi won't let you finish until they've got that one good cut from you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the worst thing to do when you're really, really tired is to go, okay, I'll just I'll put half the energy into this mm-hmm. cut. Because yeah. then the kakarigeko won't stop. Yeah, but he also knew when to stop. Mm. He also knew that you got to the point where you really were about to collapse, you know. Um, and when I went to squad training, Hong Kong squad training, mm-hmm. during Kikari Keiko, there was one or two people that were actually quite very, very sick, you know, because the senses was one eighth down my sensei and then the rest of them were seventh downs. And they would push you and push you and push you. Um, but it's it's good practice. It really is because you, you feel awful at the time. But it teaches you so much afterwards when you think when you think about what you've done and you think back. And then also when you're doing your keiko, um, you you realise that what you learn in kikari keiko is is coming forward in your in your ordinary keiko. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, someone who just commented. Oh yes, I would love to get tortured by my sensei as well. I'm like, well, <laughs> okay, yes, but no, torture? it's not actually torture. It's really enjoyable. It's just you're in a lot of pain at the time. Yeah. Not making a good point. Once you understand, you'll understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, one second. Just trying to think about the questions because no more. Oh, That's okay. Baz has joined in. Baz, have you got any questions? Hi, Baz. Oh, somebody's asking how can how how can they relax in training? I've heard so many different. Uh, ways of doing it, but in what way are they wanting to relax? They just get told, keep on. They just keep on getting told to relax. Okay, so I'm, I'm so, assuming it's the shoulders, really. Yeah. So everybody, I mean, I'm fourth down, and I t- I still tend to get tense sometimes when I'm excited or if I'm worried about something or just before a down exam or whatever. The one thing that I found that really helped me was um, to really think about what you're doing every single time. So when you're doing keiko or if you're doing uchikome is to focus on your breathing and focus, just like what I spoke about the last time about ki, was to try and take a deep breath and push it down towards your dantian so your energy is going down into your lower half of your body. And if you do that, then your arms automatically become quite relaxed. And then when you move, you move more from your pelvis rather than your body going first. Sorry, your hands going first. Um, So that's one thing, that's one way that you can relax. The other way that you can relax is taking a deep breath and doing a massive ki. That also really helps you to relax because you expel all this energy and all the tense and then... Um, so yeah, and focus on your feet. Have you heard the method of relaxing, which is um, basically break yourself to the point that you can't do anything else with energy, so you have to do it relaxed? So like mm-hmm. make make yeah. beginners do, when they understand how to do kirikaishi properly, basically mm-hmm. make them do a solid hour of kirikaishi without breaks, yeah. or like without long breaks. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. good to do in like a set of three, and it's like, yeah doing it, receiving it, small break. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of that hour, you will definitely be a lot more relaxed than the start, mm-hmm. but not... Yeah. Do you think that's a good method, or have you used Yeah, I mean, that, that was... I, I think that was why our training in Hong Kong was, was the way it was, because, you know, the, the warm-up started very slowly. Sensei always used to say, start slowly, build up, build up, and it's the same... It's the same here when we do warm up here with um, Jerry Sensei. He always likes to start with the stretching and and everything. And he always says to the beginners, make sure that you stretch properly, 
you know. Um, so to begin with, practice should be slow. Um, all the subaries should be done big, so you're relaxing your muscles and your shoulders. Um, and then as you progress through the through the training, um, as I said, we used to do Uchikome, Kikari Keiko again and again and again and again. And then Kikari Keiko with Sensei until the point that you were about to drop. Um, and then he would just shout Keiko. And you were expected then to go straight into Keiko. So by the time you got, you're right, Izzy, by the time you got to Keiko, you're thinking, oh. But because you are tired, you're focusing more on your breathing because you need to breathe because you're tired. So your energy automatically goes straight into your pelvis. Um, if, uh, Baz, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, Baz, I've been to Kitamoto and I know you've been to Kitamoto too. I don't know if it was the same when you were there, but when I was there, I have never been practicing on such a floor that was so slippy. And boy, that really, by the end of the week, I wasn't slipping because I had to really focus on my legs. And that really taught me a lot. I don't know if you were the same. Don't well, know. there's a small delay, so I'm sure he'll, he will say. But like, I can also say, when, you have, when you're training on a slippy floor, you get used to a slippy floor. It's really mm. weird. Yeah. No, the first time I was in Keto yeah. Ottawa, our, our first Keiko, I, I landed in my backside and everybody was like, whoa, what did, they, what, what did they do to this? Put pledge on it or something? But it really did make me think. And my footwork when I got back was, uh, oh, it was a lot better than, you know, before I went. So, yeah, and that really made you think about your legs. and Because you had to think to yourself, how can I move without slipping? You know, so... You, you're automatically thinking about your feet because you don't want to you don't want to end up on your backside and with all these eight dance senses watching you. So you you automatically forget what your arms are doing. So your arms are relaxed. So yeah. actually, I was talking about this. Um, sorry, Baz, we'll get onto your question a bit later. I was talking about this in <laughs> my session on Wednesday, and I was like, the most important things in kendo in list of importance is breathing, posture, footwork everything else mm. would you agree with that or do you have a different order because i know some people like switch around breathing and posture um i think footwork's very important mm. um breathing is also very important because of the ki and because that's so pivotal and what we're trying to do in kendo is build our spirit um i think they're all very e equally very important um but um I think out of all of them, I think ki and footwork, footwork definitely is one of the biggest ones, um, which I really struggled with because I, um, some people may know this, but um, I have I sometimes I, did, I get my left and my right mixed up quite a lot. And if somebody says to me quickly, lift up your left hand, I've got to think very carefully. So... Um, when I first started in kendo, I used to get so mixed up. My, my legs were all over the place, my hands were everywhere. And sometimes if I was learning something new, it would take me a wee bit longer than most people. Um, so footwork, footwork for me was quite difficult to start off with in kendo because I really had to think about what my feet were doing because it was left, right, right, left, you know. So, yeah, footwork, I think, is important. I think it's all important, but, yeah. Sorry for leaving it for a while. Uh, from what you were saying on Motodachi creating distance during the Chikomi, what are your thoughts on Kakarate creating distance to better understand their own Ma'ai? Okay, is this during uh, Kakari Keiko or? I think it could. Uh, this is during Uchikomi Geiko, but it could arguably. Well, no, it can't be applied to Kakari Keiko. I'm talking out of my backside. Uh, yes, it's just during Uchikami Geiko. Okay, so what's the question again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, so basically, what are your thoughts on the Motodachi, like, letting the Kakerite create their own distance? Okay, so... so like, they're still being active, but they're kind of staying yeah. in the same place. Yeah, I think um, the, the, the Kakerite, he's asking about... Uh, mm. Yes. So I think, I think it depends on... Um, the level that you're working with. 
I think if I was a motodachi for somebody the same level as me or a third dan, um, yes, I would probably work out the first couple of hits where their tomai is and then stay there and let them go through and turn around. And if they're far away, then they obviously know that they're moving too far away because you can move too far away and lose the engagement. Um, you need to stay within each other's space, if you know what I mean. So I think from that point of view, then that's a learning experience more for the karate. Um, I think for a junior karate, I think it's very important that the motodachi follow so that when the karate turn round, they see the distance that they have to be. Because if you're away, if motodachi is here and the junior karate is here, they'll take two or three steps and then it won't be very obvious to them that this is where they have to start from. They'll think it's back here. So um, for it to come, I think it depends on who your karate is, um, depends on what they understand. Does that make sense? Definitely answers my question. That, that makes sense to me, and I'm sure it will make sense to a lot of the beginners. Let's just wait for Baz to type if that is the answer that he was looking for. Sorry? Let's see if that's the answer that okay. he was looking for. Okay. I'm sorry if it's not. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he's doing what I do, which is basically uh, ask a question which I have my own opinions on or have heard mm. from somebody else because yeah. I want to hear your opinions on it. And I want mm. beginners to hear this kind of stuff because I am yeah. hoping that beginners are watching because mm. there should be a lot of them. Me looking at all the beginners who I can't see and are not in my house. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for an act, an absolute absolute beginner, because no more questions are coming in at the moment. Okay. Uh, what stage? Did that? Must... Sorry, did that answer Bazzi's question? He hasn't typed it in yet. All right. Okay. Fine. I, I'm hoping it has. If not, we will circle back to it. Um, okay. But when. So let's just imagine there's a complete beginner. Mm -hmm. What should they be doing to work up to be able to do a good Tommy vehicle? I think um, what you should be doing with them is taking them through step by step mm. a main cut to begin with and explain to them the different parts of the Shanae and what they represent because at the end of the day they've got to hit the proper part of the bogu with the proper part of the shanai otherwise it's not an ipon so i think if they understand that first then they understand why they have to step back and understand why they have to come from a certain distance rather than coming too forward if you know what i mean i've i've had so many beginners when they come and hit main for the first time yeah you've got half a shanai around the back of your main and you've got to explain to them then you know if this was a real sword the cutting bit is only this part, you know, or this part or whatever. So I think they have to know that right from the beginning rather than just say, okay, with this big stick, you you, you hit men. I think it's very important that they understand why they're doing it. Um, and then once they've done that, then um, explain about the footwork and how it all works together. Um, movement in kendo to begin with is very awkward. It's like I've had many... I had a beginner's class just before lockdown and there was two or three of them in the class who had done karate before or some other kind of martial art. And you can always tell because they stand a different way and they've always got their feet, you know, in a different way and they can't get out of that. And every single one of them said that the movement and the footwork and trying to get it all in time with the proper cutting was really difficult. Um, so... I think for a complete beginner, you need to break it down into sections for them and take it one step at a time, but explain why they're doing it, because there's always a reason. I say this so many times, there's always a reason for doing everything in kendo, no matter how small, there's always a reason. So I think if they understand, then it becomes easier for them to know what they're supposed to be doing. Definitely. Yeah. So what can you say that, like, since we are basically in a thing of we cannot go to the dojo, what can beginners uh -huh. do on their own so that when they do finally get to the dojo, they mm -hmm. can 
not exactly boost, but like they will accelerate a lot more rather mm-hmm. than not doing anything at the moment. Yeah, I think there's some very simple things that they can do. Like if um, people are doing Zoom sessions, I mean, I joined um, Glasgow University Kendo on Monday and we had one, we had, well, we had a couple of people, but one of them was a complete, not, not a complete beginner, but he was very, very new. Um, so from a teacher point of view, it was very difficult at times to explain what he was doing wrong. Um, you know, especially the way he was holding the shanai, trying to explain about the, the, the left hand having to be in a certain position and I had to adjust the screen to show him. Um, so just basic swings, I think, explaining to them about the basic footwork. If they understand about Suryash, if they understand about Fumakomi, when they do Fumakomi, why they do Fumakomi, um, just try and focus on the basics and then practice it at home. They'd be best to practice in front of a mirror so they can see what their feet are doing, what their arms are doing, you know, so that if they if they see the person teaching in front of them in Zoom, then they know what they should look like and then they can emulate that in the in in the mirror. But I do think at the moment it is difficult for beginners, especially well for, for everyone, but especially for beginners because they see on Zoom and then they go and practice on their own. And, you know, it's difficult when they're not practicing regularly physically for you to sort stuff out that they're doing wrong. Um, so I think if they're taught the basics first, like basic footwork, this is how you hold a shanai, this is how you swing, try and do it all together. Doing subiri is never a waste of time. You know, doing basic subiri, you know, is always the, some, sometimes the best thing to do. So I think that's what they should be. You should be focusing on that's great and i do hope all the beginners listening are listening to that and like i <laughs> this this has been echoed by everyone who have, i've spoken to so you better not be slacking off on the basics <laughs> even those people who are just like oh, i've been doing it for a year or two i'm not really a beginner no basics the other thing is you don't, the other thing is you don't even need a shanai to I was explaining to this young lad, you know, he, he was he was doing this, you know, as he came forward. He was, you know, bending his wrist. So there was a, there's a very simple exercise that I was taught by my sensei in Hong Kong. Um, and he said, you start off with something very simple, even if it's a pencil or a stick or something. You've got to move your shanai from this way to this way without bending your wrist. So he, we, we all practiced it, you know, all of us, even the guys who were first, second dance, we practiced it all together on Zoom. And then he started doing main subiri and it, it looked totally different. And I said to him, your wrist is not moving now. So keep practicing that. So it's these kind of things that are really useful for the beginners, you know, something small like that, small but really important, mm-hmm. you know, so... Yeah, but, but I, are you talking about the exercise where you were telling me that you went for a run after and found a stick? Yep. Yep, that one. And you still got the stick, the stick in your shanai bag? Yes, it's, yep. a, it's, it's, it's a piece of real bamboo from a mountain up in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that story, honestly. Mm-hmm. So have we got any more questions? People stop stop interacting with the chat. Come on, guys, talk. That's all right. Oh, I know, but I'm I'm also just like, come on, use this time to socialize and chat with each other. We've got people from all across the UK ish. I think it's mainly Scotland. I don't know what those people in England are doing. I'm trying to get people in, but oh, oh. That's okay. Yeah, I don't think we have. Any more questions? Is there anything else that you would like to add on and go, we um, should definitely be doing this? I think um, I'm, I get really, um, angry is probably the wrong word, but um, I think it's very, very important when you're a motodachi, even if you're a junior and you get told, okay, now you're a motodachi for this person, um, even if you don't understand completely what you are doing, 
you should ask. And if you're practicing with a senior and the senior is the karate, the senior should be teaching you because everyone has to learn how to do how to be a motodachi correctly. And it's so, so important because if you cannot get into the right distance, if you cannot engage properly, if you don't open properly, people can't learn properly. And it's so important, you know. So I think to me that's taking from from what I've spoken about today about the Kakani Keiko and the Uchikomi, I think the big thing that I would say is the motodachi is really important, you know, to be able to do both of these really important exercises really, really well. Um, so, and motodachi is not easy. I mean, the first time Sensei said to me, right, you're, you're on the motodachi side, I was like, oh, you know. <laughs> um, but it taught me a lot very quickly. You know, because I was being wanted actually for people that were more senior to me, but luckily they were, they were, they, they, they were good and they explained, okay, you're doing that wrong, do this, and you have to explain to them, you have to tell them you're doing this wrong, do it this way, um, in a constructive way, not you're rubbish. <laughs> that's that's not the best way. So honestly, so, I've yeah. had comments where it's like you're rubbish, and I'm like, thank you, that's great, I like that. <laughs> no. No. We should all remember that at one point we were all beginners at one point. Mm. Yeah. So we do now have another question from Baz. What are your thoughts about beginners watching online videos to practice on their own? Like uh, kendoguide.com and kendostar and... I can't think of any other ones. I think... Um... I think sometimes it's okay, but um, I think other times you have to be very careful because there are some some videos out there um, that just show the wrong zanshin, the wrong kind of ki. Um, but again, this is this is all individual um, individual styles. You know, everybody's got a specific style of kendo. Um, they've all got specific key eyes, they've all got specific ways of doing things. Um, and th what I said the other day was if you ask an eight, eight, five, eight dance senses the same thing, you'll get five different answers. But what I would say is um, I think th th what they should be doing is watching videos that are um, from a good source. So um, I know that um, Andy Fisher does a lot of videos. Um, his videos are very good. Um, I've watched some of his videos, especially when he's doing things for juniors, um, and it's very broken down. It's well explained, and you can actually watch, you know, two kendoka slowly doing stuff together. I think that kind of thing is very good. Mm -hmm. um, but other stuff that's kind of more kind of theatrical, if you like, I think you've got to be careful with that, you know. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with watching. Um, the problem with beginners is um, they maybe see something that they think, oh, that, oh, that looks cool. And it's, it's, it's maybe not the correct way that Kendo is done, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, it's, it's a minefield for them. Yeah, you know? so, I mean, like, you see, because you, can know, you know when beginners from your dojo have started watching videos when they start doing showy off Kendo. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why are you smacking your shy on the ground? Mm. Yeah, I mean, as I said, everybody's got their own style, you know, and, and it's nice when you see people with different styles, but um, I'm probably more, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but I'm probably more an old fashioned kind of, I like to see the old fashioned clear cut ippons, you know rather than the kind of, yeah, um, not the proper zanshin or cote like this, you know. Um, but uh, everybody's different, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Every sensei is different as well, and mm -hmm. depending on the sensei that he's learning from as well. Because, like, mm -hmm. you have exactly. a sensei who is maybe uh, not, 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 not as high rank than wise, but, like, if they're a bit younger as well. Mm -hmm they might still be doing a lot more of uh, not Shi'ai Kendo, but you know what I'm talking about, like a lot mm -hmm. quicker Kendo mm -hmm. because everyone's Kendo does really change as they age because it has to and then 
Yes, <laughs> mine has. <laughs> but like, it's it's a good way because you you learn how to do it more effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, uh, so yeah. Sorry, that was a small tangent. I am uh, I I am talking not much sense, but um, without saying you think and ask your sensei if a video is worth following. So, like. Uh, would you suggest that it would be a good idea if, like, a beginner were going up to the sensei or their coach or anyone that they're teaching, her, who's teaching them and going, is this video a good video? And or asking, can you give me video content to watch? Um, certainly our sensei in Hong Kong used to share videos with us. So we had a, we've got a Facebook page, obviously, like every other um, kind of dojo. And um he would post videos and say, look at this, this is a good upon, or this is the zanshin that I told you not to do, or, um, you know, I, there was things that I used to say to him, you know, what, what could I watch that's, um, that, that's you know, good to practice? And he, he would say the same as what I'm saying, you know, be careful what you watch. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with asking. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just... Yeah, as I said, he used to share videos with us, you know, and um, and sometimes they weren't always kendo videos. So um, <clears throat> it took me a long time to understand about semi, um, which is why it took me so long to get my fourth down. <laughs> but um, um, I was saying to my sensei in Hong Kong when I was here trying to sit my fourth down, and I said, I really don't understand about semi and I'm trying to demonstrate it and I don't know if I'm doing it right. And and he showed me um, a video of a puppy and I think it was a, a chicken. And they were both trying to go for a piece of something that was lying on the on the ground. And the chicken was moving slowly and slowly and it was trying to get as close as it could without the puppy chasing it. And it was a five minute video and he showed me this and he said, this is semi. So it's things like that that not only just watching people doing kendo, but life in general. There's things out there that teaches you, you know. And this is the, this is the way I, I was taught, you know. So it might might sound a bit too kind of um, I don't know out of the way for some people, you know. So, but as I said, everybody's different how they how they learn. So. I would really like to see that video as well. It's <laughs> quite amazing. Well, I, watched I watched it and I thought, ah, okay. Yeah, there's also the joke about semi. It's, um, it's not actually real. It's just the thing that eight fans made up to annoy beginners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Clarification on Baz's question. What he means is there are a lot of really bad videos, especially at the moment. Oh, yeah. I, I would like more comments about this and students may be able to ask their sensei if the technique is good or if it should be ignored are you meaning it's bad kendo or bad kendo content if that makes any sense mm-hmm. if that uh, can clarify but in the meantime oh wait no. some of it is very bad how bad i'm kind of interested can you send links of how bad some of this stuff is? Because <laughs> I, I, I do believe, I do believe that. And I'm, not, I'm also not going to say that our stuff isn't, isn't brilliant. I think good it's also... But not good technique. So I say that again? Good? Good intentions, but not good technique. Yeah. So what's he asking again? Sorry. Uh, so... There's a lot of really bad videos being posted up at the moment because quarantine Mm -hmm. Uh, and students may be able to ask their sensei if the technique is good in the video or if it should be ignored and there are people putting up videos with good intentions but bad technique Mm -hmm. I think it's quite subjective because again what one sensei will see is okay another sensei might not so um it's, 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 it's a difficult one. Um, he is he asking is it okay to ask the sensei or I don't. I, he's asking is it okay to ask whoever is teaching you 
Is this video a good technique or not? I'm pretty sure if you could clarify if that's definitely what he's asking. Sorry. Because <laughs> I can't, apparently I can't actually read, which is like, it makes sense, but I can't read at all. I'm also completely blind and we'll just miss so many things. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a good thing to even like, uh, maybe just, since we do have all this video calling stuff, basically ask your mm. coach, yo, is it okay if I jump? Obviously not this informal, sorry. <laughs> just to clarify. Yeah. Don't don't go up to them then and they go, yo, mm. can you explain this video yeah. to me? Yeah. I mean, I suppose there's no harm in asking your sensei if you can approach him like that to, to show a video and say, you know, like, is, is this okay to watch this and, and learn from this? I think... Um, you know, the relationship that we all had with um, Sensei in Hong Kong is very different from the relationship that I've got, say, with Jerry Sensei here or Baz Sensei or, you know, um, other Senseis. Um, so I think you know, Kishikawa Sensei used to encourage us to, to watch um, certain things um, and just be careful with other things that we were watching. So quite often I would say to him, what's, what's a good thing to watch? Um, so, but as I said, I mean, it's a minefield at the moment. Baz is right. There's so much stuff out there that's just crazy. So, but yes, I think probably to ask your sense's guidance might be a good idea. Um, so what is your opinion on watching videos of bad kendo and trying to figure out what's exactly bad about it? Like, not um, beginner beginners, but, like, maybe no. people who are, like, a year on and they're they're looking at the kendo and going, okay, what have I been taught? What's happening here? What's the difference? Is mm -hmm. this something that I could apply? Or is this something that they may be doing wrong and I should be looking out for in my own kendo? Mm -hmm. I think, again, sometimes that can be difficult because um, kendo, as you know, especially during competitions can be really quick and really fast and sometimes things happen that they didn't mean to happen because of the way the other person has moved or the way the shenanigans have um, clashed so sometimes it's very difficult especially for juniors to look at something and think hmm that's something that I should be doing or that's something that I shouldn't do you know I think so it takes a trained eye to be able to see something I think that will say oh that was actually a mistake or Mm, because normally you can a trained eye can tell with the way somebody's moving and the way that they're intending to do things whether that's what actually was supposed to happen um, so I think it can be difficult um, I think from that point of view it might be best to ask your sensei you know what can I do to improve what am I doing wrong because I think unless unless you're quite experienced um, I think it's very difficult sometimes mm -hmm. to because I, I I remember um in Hong Kong we had this um tournament called the Asian tournament which is um the biggest tournament next to the world championships um and the first couple of years I was very junior and I used to go just to help and I used to watch this kendo um and, and it was all um you know um people who were fighting for their countries and it was countries from all over Asia that would join and I would watch this kendo and I would think to myself, well, why is that in the pawn? Why is that not in the pawn? And it was only when I started fighting in the tournament myself, that I understood, okay, this is in the pawn, or I understand now why that wasn't in the pawn. Because when you're actually in the fight yourself, and a trained eye will see, that's why only certain people of a certain dan can be, um, you know, the yeah, the shin, the shin pan, um, because you need to know hmm, that was meant or that's not meant. So I think that can be quite difficult for juniors to look at and, and kind of sort out, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So following on from that, what can people do to actually try and get their eyes more trained and more accustomed to this kind of stuff without being able to go back into the dojo and like actually train with other people? Like I don't, I don't advise beginners watching Shi'ai content because... Sometimes you get some good kendo. Most mm -hmm. of the time, it's not great kendo. It's it's a lot better to watch normal keiko or uchikomi geiko, or um, 
Mitori Eko, which is mm-hmm. learning through practice, learning through watching. Watching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what what can really beginners do other than just watch? What should they really be thinking about whilst they're watching? Like, I think it's good. Content? I think it's also very important for the senses and the teachers if they know that somebody's watching. You and I were talking about this, Izzy, before we came on. Um, was my sensei sometimes, you know, if, if, if I couldn't join, if I wasn't well, or if I had to stop halfway, he would say, right, sit down and watch. And most times when people say, just sit down and watch, you're sitting down and, and you're watching. After my watching, he would turn around to me and say, what have you learned? You know, and he would say, watch the seniors. Don't watch the juniors, but watch the seniors. So... I think it's all very well to sit and watch, but I think it's very important for the teachers and the senses to actually ask the juniors afterwards, what have you seen? What have you learned? Do you know what I mean? Then you can figure out, have they actually picked this up? Have they actually learned that? Oh, they've picked that out. That's really good. They've actually been watching that. You know, so I think that's probably more appropriate than watching videos. If we're talking about people who are not exactly beginners but not really high rank, so maybe shodan, nidan, mm-hmm. uh, what can they do, especially in this long gap of no training, what can they do to properly train their eyes to be able to actually see an ippon? Because it's very easy to know an ippon when you've done it in person. So mm-hmm. It's very difficult to even look at a fight when you're in person and go, was that an ippon? Mm-hmm. So what, what can they really do? I think sometimes um, it, it is difficult at the moment, you know, and sometimes the only thing you can do is to watch Shi'ai. You know, um, David and I, my son, sometimes we watch some of the Ippon from the World Championships, um, which is a, one of the really good ways of, you know, catching, you know, especially some of the Japanese guys and girls that, you know, they, they hit an Ippon and... You know, it's a quote and you think, was it? And you go back and you look at it again and you think, wow, that was so fast. You know, so I think something like that, or something of that calibre, you know, is good to try and watch. Um, and as you're watching, try and see what they're doing, what the Shanais are doing and where the Shanai lands and see if you would call it as an upon. Um, and, you know, and then you can see... That, I mean, as I said, that's what David and I have done before. Um, but again, it's it is hard at the moment because you're not you've not got that engagement in the dojo. So yeah. Well, I will say to everyone who is watching, we do have a Kendo Discord, and if you if any beginners just want to kind of analyze the video, post it on the main chat, and then see if anybody actually wants to help you analyze it and see what's happening. So that we can actually get a bit more of community going on and people talking from across dojos and going and trying to help each other because we're not we're not just loads of small dojos we are an entire kendo community in the uk and mm. arguably well not arguably and worldwide we're all wanting to improve our own kendo and improve ourselves and we can easily do that if we also help others as well that might be all the questions that we have had and it is also uh just over an hour which is great timing (laughs) my Uh, phone ringing (laughs) is there anything else you would like to say before we close off this lovely talk um i don't think so just thanks for watching and um thank you for the questions um yeah and take care and stay safe thank you all for coming Lovely to see you all, and I hope that you come back next week and every week after. And also, please suggest video topics and also put forward people who would like to speak. We're always looking for as many people as is humanly possible. Thank you all for coming. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.